Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and a very good early morning to our colleagues that are joining us from New Zealand and Australia. It's indeed a pleasure to have you joining in with your colleagues in Canada and the United States today. So a very big welcome uh, to everybody in joining us for today's webinar, Meet the Authors, Public Participation for 21st Century Democracy. Um, uh, right off the get-go, I would like to thank both Tina and Matt on behalf of IAP2 USA and IAP2 Canada for joining us. Um, it's really a real pleasure and, uh, and, and we're definitely looking forward to today's uh, webinar. So thank you very much to both of you. But before we get going, I am just going to hand it over to Drew just to give a little bit of housekeeping items and then we're going to get underway. So Drew, over to you. All right. This is a very uh, interactive uh, session, and so we encourage you to take part in this. There's a couple of ways you can do it. Well, actually, three ways you can do it. We've got some poll questions that we will be asking throughout this, so so uh, please take part in it that way. There's a couple of ways you can ask questions or make comments. Uh, you'll see a little hand icon on your screen there on the on the control panel just click that and uh, we'll see a little hand go up on our screen and that will indicate that you want to speak and so at some point Amelia will open your microphone and uh, you'll get a chance to ask your question the other way if you don't feel like actually speaking it out is to write it in the question box there type it in and uh, Amelia will see your question come up but at some appropriate moment she will uh, break in and ask the question for you and then you can get your uh, your question or your comment put forward to Matt and Tina. Uh, this is being recorded for your future professional development use and uh, we usually have that uh, sent out, the, the link to that sent out to you uh, by the end of the day. So uh, you'll have that alongside, along with, with any other collateral material that Matt and Tina have for us. So you'll have that, that opportunity too. And uh, we just ask you to take part. Oh, one other thing. Uh, we'll, we'll control your microphone, so if you've got your microphone on mute, please take it off mute and we'll control that. We keep everything on mute because there's always the chance of some kind of feedback going through from your computers via your computer microphone, your computer um, speakers, and that can be very distracting, very annoying actually. So we keep everybody on mute, but if you put your hand up, we'll take it off mute at that point. So with that, thank you very much. Amelia, we'll give it back to you. Well, thanks very much, Drew, and uh, as Drew mentioned, my name is Amelia Shaw, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. Uh, we will let you know that uh, every now and again, voices may fade in and out. We do our very best with the webinar technology that we have, um, but let us know if you can't hear us, and we'll definitely see what we can do, but if the voice occasionally drops, our apologies in advance. Um, so, Rosa, you've got your hand up, so I'm presuming you want to ask a question. So I'm going to open up your mic uh, just before we get going just to see if that is a question. Uh, Rosa, did you have a question for us before we get going? No. Okay, so just testing out the hand, so that works and that's terrific. Um, so with that, I am going to introduce Tina and Matt. Uh, Tina is an Associate Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs at the Syracuse University Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Tina is also the co-director of the Collaborative Governance Initiative at Maxwell's Program for the Advancement of Research on Conflict and Collaboration. Tina's research focuses on citizen participation processes, uh, sorry, uh, Tina's research focuses on citizen participation, collaborative governance, alternative dispute resolution, and other democratic governance processes in public administration, as well as co-authoring public participation for 21st century democracy with Matt. Tina is the lead editor of Democracy in Motion, evaluating the practice and impact of deliberative civic engagement, and co-author of Collaborative Government governance regimes. So welcome, Tina. Now Matt. Matt Leniger leads public agendas work in public engagement and democratic governance and directs the Yankelvich Center for Public Judgment. Uh, previously, Matt was the executive director of the Deliberative Democracy Consortium, an alliance of major organizations, which included public agenda, and le leading scholars working in the field of deliberation and public participation. The DDC represents more than 50 foundations, nonprofit organizations, and universities collaborating to support research activities and advance democratic practice in North America and around the world. 
Now, over the last 20 years, Matt's been busy. Um, <laughs> Matt has worked with public participation and efforts in over 100 communities in 40 states and four Canadian provinces. Matt serves on the boards of eDemocracy.org, IEP2USA, the Democracy Imperative, and the Participatory Budgeting Project. Matt is also a senior associate for Everyday Democracy. Matt, I have no idea how you do all this, but I really thank both you and Tina for joining us. Now, before we get going, we actually have two poll questions. So, uh, Drew, I'm going to ask you to put up those poll questions. So, the first question, in, which, in what sector do you do most of your participation work? So, if all of you could please respond to that question. And as it says, it applies to everything. So please select all that apply. We're going to close this in about three seconds. OK, Drew, let's close this down. And let's see where people are from and where they're working in. All righty. So for Matt and Tina, 58% of the participants Paul, work for local government. 22% work for state or provincial government. 6% work for national government. 22% work for nonprofit, and 11% are in engagement. And just so that everyone knows, we're expecting about 60 people today, and at the moment we have 53 people joining us, so that's just terrific. So very big welcome to everybody. And now we're going to go to the next question, Drew, if we can. Alrighty. So what is your biggest frustration with the current state of public participation. Now there, that's opening up a hornet's nest. So go for it. Let us know. Alrighty then. So we're going to close this and we'll see what they have to say, Matt and Tina. So then you can <laughs> you can see what you're going to raise up the up, up the profile as we move in. We didn't allow it all of the all of the above. All right. <laughs> All of the above? No, we didn't. <laughs> You're so right. All right. So biggest frustration. Uh, reliance on conventional forms of participation is 33%. Challenges of recruitment is 7%. Use of participation as a one-off process is 30%. And difficulties in explaining participation and its importance is 30%. That's fascinating. Thank you very much to all our participants. And Matt, and Tina, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Amelia. It's, it's uh, a pleasure to be part of this and, and really exciting to be talking to people. I know we have people from all over the world, so that's, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Tina, do you want to say, say anything up front? Well, no, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really excited to hear people's comments and answer questions. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And what really interesting full responses. Yes. It, yeah. There, they're great. Now, Matt, we're not seeing your screen yet, so there we go. I think we're coming up now. Perfect. There we are. Brilliant. Good. Okay. So, um, and I'll, I'll our, our kind of format here is, is we're just going to kind of try to zip through some slides and, and kind of trade off uh, for every three slides or so. Um, and then, um, as Amelia said, you, you, you will, we'll have time for questions and more discussion at the end. And meanwhile, I think people will have a chance to kind of put questions into chat if, if, if you want to um, as we go so that we, um, we may be able to kind of get to a few of those as, as we're going here. But if not, we'll have them queued up at least for the end. Does that sound all right, Amelia? Yeah, that sounds great. But actually, if they could either put them in the question box or if they could, uh, that would be my preference because I will be paying close attention to the uh, question box. And just to let you know, Matt, even before we got going, there was a quick question from Ron about what is the definition of conventional participation. So uh, I'm, so people are already participating. So this is great. It's, it, it bodes well for the rest of, the, of today's webinar. Thanks, Matt. Right. Back to you. Well, and that points to one of our immediate challenges I know a lot of people marked in the poll, which is kind of uh, frustration with our inability to kind of articulate what participation is, the fact that we have all these different kinds of terms and jargon, and none of them are terribly kind of clear or compelling. Um, so we're going to try to kind of, uh, Tina and I will try to, to define what we mean as we go here. Um, and, and I think we'll talk a little bit about kind of how do we actually then use some of the, that language or other language to actually make some of this work more compelling to, to people who don't know much about it. Uh, conventional participation, Tina and I are, are thinking of kind of tr traditional kind of 
you know, three minutes on a microphone type of public meeting. I mean, that's probably the most well-known, most common, and most frustrating uh, form of participation in the world today. It happens seemingly almost everywhere. Uh, it's not a format that seems to work for anybody, and so I think Tina and I are quite <laughs> we're often surprised that it keeps happening, <laughs> but uh, it, we can talk a little bit about why, why that is. Um, there's other conventional forms of participation, like public comment periods and things like that, but I think probably the, the three minutes at a microphone public meeting is, is kind of the one that, that you know, is most well known. I um, just want to say that, that uh, in addition to the book, obviously, which people can get in a variety of ways, there's also a lot of free stuff, uh, which is at that uh, Wiley Press uh, website that I've uh, included the link for there. Uh, and one of, the, one of the free things that's up there is, is a skills module, which talks about all the different kinds of things that we have come across, uh, important skills that people need to have to do public participation, well, or at least need to know about. They don't necessarily have to have them all, but uh, need to know about in order to organize really good good public engagement. Um, the other thing is, is that I, I want to kind of um, say off the bat is just that you know, what, one thing that inspired Tina and I to kind of write this thing is, is, is that we felt like a lot of us in this field are kind of in the same boat. We're kind of up against the same kinds of challenges. Uh, we've proved some of the same kinds of things, which is that you know, public participation can be incredibly powerful, um, can help people address all kinds of public problems. And so we spent the first you know, couple chapters in the book kind of explaining why and giving some of the, the different kinds of, of evidence that, that shows that participation works, uh, but that we're all also up, up against this kind of fairly common challenge in that most of these participation efforts are kind of one-off, uh, temporary kinds of, effort, uh, of things. Um, and that, that what we're lacking in, in most places is the kind of infrastructure that we need in order to sustain participation. So that we're not continually trying to kind of convene people over and over on the issue or crisis of the moment, but we've got people who are assembled in various ways that are good for them, interesting for them, good for government, good for different kinds of organizations, and that that, that, is, that, that is what we mean by, by participation infrastructure. Um, and to support that kind of infrastructure, that regular sustained kind of, of engagement, there are or could be various kinds of laws, processes, institutions, groups, associations, um, and that all of this kind of the, the scaffolding, what it's helping to, to support is regular opportunities where people get together, they connect with each other, solve problems, make decisions, and they're part of a, and they feel like they're part of a community. In addition to kind of the um, some of the immediate impacts, you know, uh, and I know a lot of you have been involved in all kinds of good participation efforts, and so you've seen for yourselves and been, helped them produce to produce some of these kinds of great impacts. Um, but in addition to those kinds of immediate kind of public problem sort of, of impacts, there is also a really interesting body of evidence coming mainly from the global south, uh, particularly from Brazil, where different kinds of uh, engagement have been entrenched for a longer period of time in a kind of sustained way. And that, 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 um, that evidence seems to suggest that in, in addition to you know, participation being good for people in terms of helping them solve problems or make decisions, that in fact when you have large numbers of people involved in a day-to-day -day basis on various kinds of things in their community, that in fact has other kinds of impacts as well, these kinds of social capital sorts of impacts in terms of lowering corruption, increasing health, um, increasing redistribution of wealth, uh, tax compliance, all these different kinds of things, economic vitality. And so that, that body of research is very interesting and tantalizing for a lot of us uh, in other places as well. And part of the question that we have is how do we both produce some of these kinds of effects over time, but also measure how we're doing. Uh, Tina, do you want to take over? <laughs> Not that this is a fun thing to talk about, but do you, do you want to take over with this, uh, this next slide? I actually love talking about this. Um, so, you know, one of the things we know from research is that to get all of those benefits from using public participation, we can't continue to use the conventional processes that we have been using. And a lot of people in our field have tried to circumvent those processes, offer new different ways of, of thinking about participation. But still, the fact of the matter is, around the world, conventional participation, this three minutes at a microphone, is our number one form of public participation. And you can see in some of these pictures just the challenges that come up with that. Agendas are, are uh, officials are bored, people are angry or, or bored, or they just don't show up. And we know that this three minutes at a, at a microphone creates lots of um, challenges and reinforces this, the status quo. 
this kind of default structure has an agenda that's preset by the officials. There's no discussion outside of the agenda. In fact, in the United States, because of Sunshine Laws and Sunshine Acts, in the state of Arizona, for example, an official who responds to a comment about an issue that is not on the agenda could be arrested for violation of the Sunshine Law. These processes are oriented to getting comments on the record, but there's very little evidence that these comments that the public gives are used effectively. The processes are easy to disrupt, and we're increasingly seeing uh, disruptive practices coming from all corners of the political spectrum. And the, one of the bigger challenges of this is that the layout reinforces all sorts of power and other disparities. You have the official sitting in the front of the room, often on a dais that's raised with name plaques, and the audience set out in rows where they have to stand in line or sign up to speak at a microphone. So this three minutes at a microphone isn't helping us to solve the kinds of public problems um, that, that we need to solve. It's not an effective way for participation. So Matt and I have tried to figure out how we could improve our public participation infrastructure, and we have identified five basic um, steps that we could be taking to strengthen the opportunities and arenas and settings that people have to come together, solve problems, uh, and be part of a community. Uh, and those five ways that we've identified to improve participation infrastructure are first, to give good process, right? to treat people like adults, to treat citizens like adults, not to have this parent-child or paternalistic dynamic that we have. For the field and for uh, our officials to understand stake and thin participation and particularly ways to combine them to empower and activate the participation leaders and networks that are already out there in the world, to uh, activate several building blocks of participation, and then to provide systemic support for those building blocks. And we'll go through the first two rather quickly and then spend a little more time on the final three. Um, so the first one that probably everybody on this webinar understands is that we need to give good process. We need to treat citizens like adults. Uh, give them the respect, recognition, and responsibility they deserve. And we do this through a number of ways that, that, uh, that we already know. We give them information so that they can participate in an effective and informed way uh, about the issues. We also give them choices. We give them a chance to tell their stories, a sense of political legitimacy, that their voice will actually count, that the input that they're providing will be used to help make decisions. We provide people with opportunities to take action. People don't just want to come and talk. Often, they want to participate in the solving, uh, the solving of problems. So we need to provide different ways that, that citizens can take action. And then finally, we need to create participation experiences that are enjoyable, that are easy, that are convenient. And certainly, our conventional participation processes, whether that's the traditional public meeting with three minutes at a microphone, or our advisory committees, uh, don't provide enjoyable, easy, uh, convenient experiences for people to participate. So that's the first thing we need to do. A that's second thing we need to do is understand thick and thin participation. So Tina. Yes. Sorry, Tina, I'm, interrupt I'm interrupting for a minute because you've used an expression, and I know you're going to continue to refer to it, as thick and thin participation. And we have a yes. number of people saying, what does that mean? So <laughs> if you could help yeah. out with that, I'm sorry for interrupting. Why do you <laughs> oh, not at all. I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions, and they actually come up next thickens in participation. And, and Matt, do you want to explain thick participation? Well, I guess, um, and this is just one way of kind of thinking about these things, but I, 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 it seems to be a kind of a helpful framework for us. But basically, thick participation is about the small group. It's about empowering the small group. It's about bringing people together. And you, you see some pictures here of people you know, in, in these kinds of thick participation type settings where you're giving them a lot of information. You're giving them a chance to kind of look at different options or different arguments or, or different analyses of a problem. Um, you're giving them a chance to decide for themselves. Often you've got kind of facilitation of various kinds in these settings. Um, you're maybe using That's other kinds so of the slide. I'm sorry to interrupt, but maybe oh. advance the slide. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yes. I, I think I just lost. Uh, sorry, the slide was on, but I was on the wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I was not connected for a second there, but now I am. <laughs> so now you're seeing the the one that says thick participation at the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Awesome. Anyway, so so 
So thick participation is about the small group. It's, it's more intensive. It's more deliberative. It takes more time. You know, um, so it has a, a tremendous amount of power. People seem to like these kinds of things. Uh, but at the same time, you're asking a lot of them to do it. Um, so it, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, it has its, its, its pluses and its minuses. The second, um, oh, uh, and just here's some, some uh, kind of a few more bullet points. So, you know, a key thing about thick participation and its success is can you kind of actually produce a critical mass of people? And in particular, can you, can you turn out a, a, a kind of a large number of people who are diverse in a variety of ways? And, and, you know, they're not all on the same kind of side of the issue. They're not from the same kind of t part of town. You know, uh, they're not necessarily easy to dismiss in, in those, those senses. So, so in, in examples of kind of thick participation that, that's done well, you see the kind of proactive network-based recruitment to produce that kind of critical mass. And then I think that covered some of the, we've covered already some of the other bullets here. We're talking about small groups. We're talking about information and in, um, rich ways and decision making where the group is, has some autonomy. Um, thin participation um, is more about empowering the individual. And by the way, we've got some American examples here, but I think both thick and thin participation are kind of evident in all over the world. Um, and all over the world also they're rarely combined, um, which is an interesting challenge. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but thin participation, what we're saying here are things that, that people that don't take as much time, they're relatively easy and fast for people to do. Um, they are not necessarily online. In fact, we've had thin participation examples like surveys forever and ever. But of course, with the internet, we've got just a huge proliferation of all kinds of thin uh, opportunities for people to kind of affiliate themselves with a cause, or donate a little bit of money, or rank ideas, or um, give comments, all the, or, or you, you know, identify potholes and, and tell the public works department where they are. All of a sudden, we have a whole lot more thin participation opportunities than we ever did before. The trick is that Matt. Matt. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Matt. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh, there we go. It just flipped. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think. Our, it's so, so Matt, it's it's sure. Amelia again for just a minute. It, I'm I I will let you know that part of the issue is when there's lots of pictures on a slide, it sometimes takes a little while to pop up. So ah, okay. we just briefly we just briefly saw your thin participation with pictures, but uh, just so that you know what we can see at the moment, we can mm -hmm. see thin participation with your bullets underneath. So Perfect. so my apologies, system works great, but sometimes it's a little slow. So yeah. <laughs> thanks thanks to everybody for your patience with this. Okay, cheers. Well, I've advanced it again, so hopefully it has time to kind of make its way through the. Uh through the ether, but here's the next slide, which is about combining thick and thin participation, um, which is a very rare thing. I mean, it, it, and, and I, I, part of what, what Tina and I are arguing in the book is, is that these two forms of participation are both good. <laughs> you know, they're both really uh, better than the kind of the old-fashioned conventional kind of three minutes of microphone stuff, but they have very different strengths and weaknesses, and, and, and really you need to be looking for ways in which you can combine them. And I know a lot of you are doing this kind of work. Um, we have a couple of, of examples on the screen uh, right now. One is uh, Text, Talk, and Act, which is part of the National Dialogue on Mental Health, uh, which was using um, texting to bring together people in face-to-face -face conversations uh, all over the country to talk about mental health and how they could strengthen it. And then another very different kind of combination of thick and thin is the Citizens of Issue Review Process in Oregon, which is similar to other kinds of uh, uses of citizen juries around the world, which is you've got kind of a small set of people in a very thick sort of engagement where they're really working hard over a long period of time to kind of delve into an issue um, and give some recommendations. But then you've got thin participation opportunities for lots of other people in that province or state or in that country to kind of find out what people talked about, why they made the decisions they did, and how they might vote uh, on the ballot in the fall or what other things they might do to make an impact on the issue. Now I think I think we drew we have a, another poll I think um, related to this these concepts, um, which I, another question that you could you excellent. Could be asked. So that's great, Matt. Thanks very much for that. So the question is up right now. Do you have experience in combining thick and thin forms of participation? Yes or no. <laughs> so we'll just get everyone to respond. And we're going to close it, Drew, and let's see what the results are. 
So the results, uh, Matt and Tina, are yes, 70%, and oh, no, 30%. So 70%, so a good majority have been combining. So Excellent. thank you thank you to everyone for responding. That's a good sign. Tina, do you want to take it away with the next slide here? Uh, sure. So that's really exciting that people are combining thickens in participation. Matt and I think that this is one of the real opportunities we have for advancing public participation practice, but also uh, changing the way we think about approaching public problems and think, changing the way we think about integrating public voice into those solutions. Beyond this idea of understanding the breadth of participation processes that are out there, Matt and I also feel that we need to be, really be working to empower and activate our participation leaders and our network. In every community, in every country around the world, there already exist people who can lead participation and networks who are interested in using participation for a variety of public problems. Um, so we have not only those, those traditional uh, elected officials, public servants, civic leaders, but we also have participation professionals, a, a growing um, industry. I hesitate to use that word, but I can't think of another one at the moment. So we have lots of leaders that are out there, in addition to just our own civic leaders. But there are also networks who are interested in um, trying to work together to solve these public problems. So schools, colleges, and universities, our businesses and nonprofits, community, and particularly our youth groups are often overlooked. Social service agencies, unions, media, our neighborhood associations, and homeowner associations, these already exist in our communities. Unfortunately, because participation is often used as this one-off process, we don't spend a lot of time cultivating those networks, engaging those networks and leaders, and keeping them kind of systematically and involved in a sustained and long-term way. Matt and I feel that it's really important to begin to activate these networks to empower people to take part in, um, in participation activities. A uh, fourth characteristic for building our participation infrastructure is to assemble our participation building blocks. Uh, I think most people on the, this webinar will understand that participation can be used for a variety of ends. But because we often rely on that traditional, conventional public meeting format, it's often challenging for our leaders and our participation networks to see how participation can be used differently. And so we've identified six building blocks, six kind of large categories of activities and platforms and processes that can be used to advance public participation. Uh, and we'll go through each one of these uh, quickly. The first building block, probably the most basic building block of all, is disseminating information. Um, and technology has just made this, this easier than ever before. Unfortunately, people are also inundated with information. So the trick is to figure out how to get people information in ways that they will use it, that they will read it, that they will absorb it and respond to it. So of course there are traditional media and social media and websites, but there are all sorts of new texting systems. For example, schools are texting parents uh, and students about upcoming issues or uh, emergencies on campus or snow days. Um, there are dashboards and apps that are allowing people to kind of process and organize their information in, in different ways. Uh, robocalls are being used increasingly by elected leaders um, and, and public servants to get information out to a broad variety of groups. And then we have kind of town halls and teletown halls is more traditional ways of doing that. Two interesting ways that are developing are serious games. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean uh, Monopoly or Connect Four, but rather these games where people can come together to learn about activities, engage in problem solving. There are lots of really cool examples out there of using games to educate people and provide information, whether that's about budgeting or community planning or infrastructure development. And then also interactive community maps. People are, a lot of people are visual learners and like to see how the pieces work together. So disseminating information is the kind of basic building block for participation. Um, and just as it's important to push information out to the public, it's also important to pull information in from the public, to gather input and data from people. Citizens can also provide really important information. And we can collect that through uh, a lot of thin activities, such as surveys, polls, interviews, uh, crowdsourcing and competitions. 
There are all sorts of apps out there like C-Click Fix or Fix My Street that allow people to identify problems. We're seeing a boom in the development of these petitions and wiki-based websites where people can collaborate to solve problems. Um, in health and education, we're seeing impact assessments and rating systems. One of the neatest developments, I think, is around geotechnologies, and that's the use of GPS technologies to help map problems. So an example of that is in Louisville, Kentucky, where there are huge problems with asthma and chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disorder, or COPD. Doctors and uh, the public health officials got together and put technologies in asthma inhalers so that when people use their inhalers, they could mark the, the GPS location, the time of day, and then begin to coordinate with that with other data to see where, when, why, and how particular breathing problems were happening. One of the things that's really interesting about this is to, to think about the idea of what, um, uh, oh my gosh, Abni Namani, I'm sorry, I blanked on that name for a second, Abni Namani calls the civic upsell. And the idea here is that if people are willing to engage in crowd, crowdsourcing or participate in a wiki or use a geotechnology, they might also be willing to participate in other kinds of activities and programs. And so we need to think about how we can uh, move people from one opportunity to the next. Matt, do you want to talk about this next building block? Sure. Um, and I think you know a part of what we're trying to suggest here is kind of a, a more systemic way of thinking about participation overall. So we're giving different building blocks, but, but part of the whole idea is they need to be connected in, in a variety of ways that actually kind of really support one another. And so, you know, another pretty basic one, but one that often isn't, you know, I think doesn't get adequate, you know, um, attention from those of us who do participation work is just the whole notion of kind of giving people an, or supporting arenas where people actually discuss and connect. Um, and so some of the most interesting kind of forms of participation that I've seen recently are ones that are incredibly social. You know, the, the places um, where you've got people meeting, sometimes even weekly, uh, to talk about some kind of issue. And, and in fact, the, the talking about the issue may be only 10% of what they're doing. You know, that 90% that of what they're doing, you know, during these settings is actually just kind of hanging out, <laughs> you know, having fun, um, eating, eating, drinking, all those kinds of things, and, and that the, it's just the participation is kind of overlaid on these connections which are much more social than anything else. Um, I've been inspired by this place in, in West Virginia called Buchanan, a little tiny town, uh, where they started doing something like this uh, close to 10, 15 years ago. Um, and it's a, a kind of a regular uh, weekly lunch where people get together and talk about issues that, that, that in their community. And it's been kind of a driving force behind a, a wide variety of improvements um, made in their town. In addition to being just a good kind of, you know, a uh, way of kind of helping to strengthen the social fabric of the town. There's similar kinds of set things like that that you can see in other kinds of very different kinds of places. There's a similar process in Los Angeles that's been going on for a number of years. And I would argue that a lot of what's happened in Brazil um, and in India over the last uh, 10 to 20 years is also a result of kind of people using these kind of social occasions um, where people are just connecting and, and, and having fun and, and kind of introducing some participation elements into these other kinds of settings. Another kind of thing that, to think about when you're the, the kind of the, the system of participation in a school system or in a community or in a local government or a province is, is thinking about uh, the range of different kinds of decisions people might have or might want to make. And so one thing that struck struck us, uh, Tina and I, as we were trying to write about participation in education, is that. Many school systems uh, were engaging or trying to engage citizens around issues like, um, you know, um, school funding questions and, and what should what should be on the next school bond issue or things like that. They were trying to kind of engage large numbers of people on big uh, kinds of issues and decisions. And yet, at the most basic level, um, the, the district was still interacting with people in a fairly traditional kind of way. So that, and the thing that we thought of most was the school. Uh, the parent-teacher conference in schools. And I think this is true of, of schools all over the world, that you've got these kind of regular opportunities for parents to talk to teachers, and yet they've got embedded in them all these old kind of um, uh, traits of this kind of parent-child relationship between the institution and, and the citizen. And so they're not really allowing people to set the agenda. They're not really allowing people to bring in their experience. Um, it's a very different kind of setting. So 
if a district, a school district, just to kind of keep on with this example, if a district is, is kind of serious about having better forms of participation and to sustain participation, it's not just about kind of thinking about the big decisions that might be coming up down the pike about redistricting or funding or things like that. The other thing to be thinking about is all these other kinds of decisions that people are making, all these other kinds of settings that, that either are embedded in the system or could be introduced that would actually embody these, these kind of um, better principles of participation. And then th th at the large scale, we obviously um, this is where more of the participation work has happened, is kind of getting large numbers of people together to help make uh, big kinds of questions, big kinds of decisions facing the community. And this runs everything from participatory budgeting to you know, large scale processes to make some kind of planning decision, um, all these different kinds of things. And so we, we, these, this, this list um, is kind of a, a, just a, a list of arenas where more participatory kinds of, of things can be happening um, to actually kind of embody how uh, kind of the best principles and practices of engagement. And then finally, the, the last building block to, to, to think about is kind of the, the notion that people, in fact, can be contributing their own time and energy to solving public problems. It's not simply the kind of the, the role of government or a school system or a university or whatever other institution. It's not just a, the job of kind of public institutions to solve problems. Um, and so some of the most interesting participation activities that we, we wrote about were things where people were actually stepping forward to contribute some of their own volunteer time, energy, uh, willingness to raise money or coordinate other volunteers to do various things online, but think ways in which people were actually helping to solve problems um, themselves in addition to issuing recommendations for a city council or the school board or for the legislature. Do you want to take over this one, Tina? Sure. So we can uh, create all of these building blocks but just as you need cement to hold bricks together, you also need systemic support to hold these building blocks together. Uh, and that means that our participation leaders have to be incentivized to lead participation efforts. Um, we need to create things uh, like reward systems, maybe some performance systems for them. They also need training and skill development. Uh, as we talk to civil servants uh, all around the country, around the world, one of the challenges uh, they identify is that they would like to do participation in a different, more productive way, but don't necessarily know how to do that. So one of the things Matt and I developed that's available free online is the skills module that identifies a variety of skills that people need and identifies places where people can go to learn those skills. We need financial and other resources, and this is often a stumble, an obstacle for many people. They say, oh, well, we're, we're living in a time of austerity. How can we begin to uh, increase the budgets we have for participation? And our response to that would be, you know, the fact of the matter is we already spend tremendous amounts of resources, financial, human, technological, on public participation. But those, the, the participation processes we use aren't as effective as they could be. So we're not asking that lots of new money be devoted to any of these activities, but that we redirect some of the money we're already devoting to participation in more productive ways. We need to change our policies and procedures. Uh, this is both internal to organizations so that we're encouraging participation. In the United States, we see a lot of rules and regulations in our government agencies that limit or limit the kinds of participation that can be used and constrain public servants' ability to use participation effectively. So those internal rules and procedures need to be changed, as do our broader laws uh, around participation. And then finally, we need more evaluation. We need to be understanding, do more research to understand which particular processes work where, when, why, and how. And we need to benchmark uh, participation and look at things like who's participating, how diverse is that community, uh, how satisfied are people with processes. So those are the types of systematic support that would hold those building blocks together. There are some other ways that we can connect the building blocks for participation. There are some uh, universal pieces that really work well in all participation uh, infrastructures. One of the, the largest areas of participation or quick, quickly growing areas are hyperlocal and local online networks. This is where people can come together for support on a whole range of things from education to health to planning uh, to particular neighborhood issues that are happening. 
Uh, so these hyperlocal and local online networks are very important. We need physical hubs for participation, places where a community can gather, whether that's in the large scale or smaller scale. The good news is that we already have these in our communities. They're just not always set up for participation. Uh, youth councils, we often um, overlook youth. And we need to understand that our youth are not just leaders of tomorrow, but they can be leaders for today. So thinking about youth councils, ways to engage young people in decision making and public participation are really important. And then finally, uh, something that we are seeing in a few communities, but not many, and we think there's tremendous opportunity here, are the creation of participation commissions or advisory boards, uh, where we pull together a diverse set of our community members who advise on participation and the use of particular participation tactics to think about design, implementation, evaluating, and also on how we can begin to connect all of our opportunities for participation uh, in a way that can really help um, build a strong, sustainable participation infrastructure. There are three additional supports that we think uh, could help buttress participation and help people develop those skills. One are local participation ordinances. Um, most long-term, uh, most laws governing participation are over 30 years old, at least in the United States. And these laws really constrain, again, what people can and cannot do with participation. In the United States, there was a working group on legal frameworks for participation that has created um, a, a model local ordinance that is now being adopted in some communities around our country. Uh, a third, or second kind of additional support that could be used are citizen academies and participation training programs. We have lots of citizen academies around the world, and often these are geared at informing citizens about how government works, what the Parks and Recreation Department does, what the Planning and Zoning Commission does. But we can also use these programs to inform citizens about participation, use it as a place where they can cultivate skills for participation and actually um, put those skills into practice where they can identify issues that would be good for, communication, or for participation. And then a final uh, systemic support that could be used um, are public participation dashboard. Uh, and these could be ways where we could begin to aggregate data on turnout, demographics, participation satisfaction, and other measures of quality uh, for our participation efforts. Um, and Matt, I'll so let I you just, take over to you last one. Oh. So before Matt takes over, Tina, I, I just want to let people know that we're getting all of your questions, and I thank you very much for that. Um, we've made a decision to hold the questions until the end, so please don't panic if I haven't asked your question yet. It's coming. So I just wanted to let people know. So thank you, uh, Matt and Tina. Great. Right. And I, I think we're almost at the end here, but um, it, just to try to sum up, I mean, I, th I think that um, in many places, there are many different building blocks in place. There's various kinds of things. Or that maybe there's a particularly good youth council, or maybe there's some some really good examples of good participation on a particular type of decision, or you know some other kind of building block that might already be there. What we're seeing though is that in in most cases, that first of all, that there are many gaps, um, but, but second of all, that the the things that are working well that are there are not connected to one another. So part of what we're trying to kind of urge here is this kind of more systemic approach where we're where people might be taking stock of the things that are working well and not so well in their communities as far as participation, not just under the kind of the banner of, hey, let's get people involved in this particular decision or big problem, but kind of let's think about participation overall and how it's functioning and how it's going to allow us to, to address all kinds of things. So in order to do that, I think that kind of conversation needs to be a cross-sector conversation. It can't just be government alone. It can't just be, you know, uh, philanthropies or foundations, it can't just be universities, it's got to be a number of different sectors saying, hey, we have some stake in this together, let's think about uh, how our infrastructure looks and how we might approve it. Um, using more compelling language, and I think in most cases this is going to be local language, using the name of the community, using um, the kind of the, the things that people care about already rather than introducing um, new jargon. I mean, I think, I, I hope that some of the terms that Tina and I are using are helpful uh, to people, those of us who are kind of practitioner uh, researchers or practitioners, but I'm not sure many of these things are going to be that helpful when you're talking to regular old people about democracy in their community. Um, it's important, I think, also that we uh, realize and that we make clear that this is not simply a, a kind of a, a, a progressive vision or a conservative vision that then, in fact, 
you know, all different kinds of people of different kind of, you know, political leanings can find something that they are interested in when it comes to participation. Um, using visual aids, and we have a bunch of them in the, the book, visual aids like charts and maps um, certainly can help people tackle some of these rather abstract kinds of concepts. And if they can be artistic in the way they do that, that's all, all to the good. So I think, oops, sorry, just trying to advance the slide here. Yes, OK, so that's, and I put up again here are the links for people who want to find the, the resources, the free resources on the, on the Wiley site. But I think that, that brings us to the end of our slides. And now, Amelia, if you want to kind of let us have it with some of the, <laughs> some of the questions that have piled up. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. This there's just so much included in your in your 45 minutes already. I'm a little overwhelmed, and um, yeah. but I, I we do have some questions, and I'm really going to encourage other people to send me questions, and we'll get to those. I'm also going to encourage people to raise their hands because hey, sometimes it's nice to hear another voice on the line as well. But let me get started. From uh, Barbara, there's there's actually a, it's sort of a double-barreled one. Um, her first question was training and skill for who and then she came back with a little bit of an answer about um, from a systems perspective thinking about training the importance of training elected members of council is critical so who do you think should needs to be you know uh, provided with the skills and the training and, and what do you think is the role of the elected officials in being trained that's a, a great question, and it's a great point, and I guess my answer would be everybody. I mean, let's think about how we can train our public officials to understand what participation is, the variety of forms and processes and activities that are out there, how to do participation better. And when I talk about public officials, it's not just our elected officials. I also think that our public servants need to be trained. Most of the interaction, most of the participation that happens, happens through our administrative agencies. Uh, that's where a lot of decision decision making occurs, um, and so we need to train those our civil servants, our public servants, our, our elected officials. But we also need to train our citizens, um, and so the citizen academies are great ways where people can begin to learn the skills of dialogue, deliberation, facilitation, begin to learn uh, the basics of conflict resolution and how to identify differences between positions and interests, how to engage more effectively more constructively, more productively with each other, particularly across areas of difference. And I think this is an area where it's really important Thank to think you. about what, what people are being trained in. I mean, there's a lot of communities around the world that have citizen academies, other kinds of training programs. But when you look more carefully at what pe people are learning in those settings, a lot of it's basically about kind of, here's what government does, <laughs> you know, um, here's how we do things. And the subtext of a lot of them seems to be kind of, and this is why you should get out of the way and let us do our work. <laughs> and so, so I think the, these, that's training and kind of Republican skills and where you're, you're voting for people who are going to do all the work for you, um, hopefully. Um, and I think part of what we're, what we're urging is kind of training in democratic skills as well, where people get some of those um, lessons and, and practices in terms of um, you know, how to facilitate, how to recruit, how to organize, all those kinds of things. And in fact, uh, another more specific thing is some of the most interesting forms of training are ones where you've got public employees, public servants actually having being trained along with citizens at the same time. You know, so that you've got people who are learning the same things and also kind of making connections as they do it. Thanks, Matt. And Tina, I will let you know apparently we missed some of your answer, but I think Matt filled in as well uh, about the importance there. So my apologies if the call got dropped for a bit. We, we are doing our best. Um, but I just want to answer one question because I keep getting it. Yes, the PowerPoint should be available along with the webinar after. So within the next 24 to 48 hours, you should be able to get that as well. I think people are, are, are wanting to, to grasp your words, Tina and Matt, so I just wanted to let them know that we will do our best to get that to them. Um, it, uh, it, another question. And just, if, you really, if people want slides, among those resources on the Wiley site, there's about 10 different slide decks. So there's more slides than you can use in a lifetime if you really want, want more slides. Right, and they're all, they're all free and available, and they have slides for each chapter of the book. Right. 
You see, this is wonderful. Thank you very much, and we'll make sure that we remind everybody when we send all of the information out to them about that as well. Um, so an, an, another question from, from Anne Carroll this time. So I know you know Anne, Matt. Mm. Um, what have you or other participants found as successful methods to introduce these concepts and principles to electeds and senior staff and bring them on board with some openness and interest? So what have been your experiences? Hi, Ann. Uh, thank. And and so it, I think it sounds like the crux of the question is for elected officials in particular. Um, it, I'll, I'll I'll operate on that assumption. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But and I think there one of the keys is getting them together in settings where it's just them. Um, I've seen lots of really great um, conversations at conferences of of elected officials in, in in different countries where they've come together and kind of sharing notes about comparing notes about their experiences and in many cases part of what they're doing is venting about all their frustrations with residents <laughs> but they're having you know a candid conversation about participation that isn't just uh, you know they're not just kind of paying lip service to it they're really delving into it asking hard questions about why they want, want to do some of this kind of stuff um, and so that kind of candid conversation among peers away from reporters away from their own constituents it seems like a really critical piece um, and then, and I think from there, it, when people are in communities and having uh, opportunities to actually not just talk about this kind of stuff or learn why, you know, the research suggests it's valuable, but actually to, to, to try it out, you know. So, and I know a lot of you do this kind of work, but where you're actually kind of involving uh, people in some kind of productive participation exercise, whether there's something online or something face-to-face, -face, where they're actually kind of getting a chance to see how it works and the fact that it is, in fact, it is actually different from kind of the conventional forms of participation that they're used to and that they're, you know, understandably rather scared of. So thanks, thanks very much for that, Matt. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a shout out, uh, if I can, and that's, this is from Dawn, and uh, she said, I've already read the book and have read about, well, I'm, I've got the book and I've read about half of it, and I have to thank you for writing in clear, concise language instead Ooh, of academic speak. It's much appreciated. Right. So there you go. So just wanted <laughs> to give you that, uh, that shout out before we head to another question. And this, this is from Violetta. Uh, the combination of thick and thin participation usually requires additional financial resources than what's currently allocated. So I'm wondering if you could give examples of what you mean by no additional financial resources are needed. <laughs> yeah, that, that might have been of an, <laughs> a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> and I think you said it, you know, so you better defend it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in not all cases, not all cases will require the expenditure of additional resources. How about that? Sometimes, absolutely, we need more money than um, to do the kinds of processes that we want to do. And that's a real constraint on public participation. There's no doubt about it. We need to rethink how we're allocating resources to this. But for all of the money that we spend on public meetings, on advisory committees, um, on the kinds of conventional processes and approaches to participation, we could be reallocating some of that money toward thicker, um, thin, more thick, thinner and kind of combinations of thick and thin participation processes. In the book, Matt and I spend um, a lot of time identifying all sorts of tools and applications that are out there that can be used, that can be used for free um, or for very low cost. And as technology advances, uh, the price of these, these tools and, and techniques are going down. So a few years ago, we had to spend lots of money to buy the clickers, the little handheld voting keypads, so that everybody could vote in processes and we could get quick rankings of which issues were number one. Well, now there are all sorts of tools and apps that people can use through their phones for voting. Um, so as technology advances, the costs of those thinner forms of participation are going down. Um, you know, again, certainly in some cases, more resources need to be expended, but in other cases, it's simply thinking about how we can reallocate the resources that we use. Thanks very much. So this is just a really quick question uh, from Hugo. Uh, just wondering whether charrettes and workshops would be considered thick participation. Yeah, I, I, I would... I, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. No, I, yes, I would, I would say so. I mean, you know, we're talking about a more intensive, uh, you know, experience, uh, more time to vote required from people. Um, it's it's uh, you know it's in some ways getting them together 
you know, uh, in small groups where they're making decisions together. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would think of, of most charrettes and workshops as being as being thick. Thank you. So, so uh, maybe Tina, you can do the next question. Um, it's from Stephanie, and we've talked a lot about principles uh, in in today's uh, uh, presentation. And she's wondering how how you know how do you address these principles when you are often a one time consultant coming in in support of of local staff. So, and we have quite a number of private sector uh, consultants on today, about thirty percent. So, they're that's kind of the question. How do you do it when you're a consultant coming in? Well, I think I think that, I mean my hope or our hope is, is I think well, one of our hopes is is that for practitioners I think that this um, that what we're trying to do here is opening up a new strand of work. You know, again, I because I know having been there myself that you know in most situations as a pr practitioner you're being brought into a situation where if someone has a clear, often extremely urgent need. Um, you know, there's conflict. There's, you know, it's about a particular decision or a plan or some, some, you know, something that's, that's happening. And and so yes, it, this is a very different kind of way of thinking because you know it's it's talking about kind of the long term future and the infrastructure, not just kind of immediate needs. Um, now, I mean, you know, there are immediate needs and there will continue to be immediate needs. In fact, Tina and I, this is one of the discussions we had in the course of the book. We actually have a whole chapter which is basically devoted to you know how do you pick a particular type of process or approach or, or combination of things that will fit a particular set of goals. And so, yeah, we, that's certainly going to continue. But I think the, the argument you'd be making as a practitioner um, in terms of talking about infrastructure is um, more of an economy of scale argument. You know, look, um, we've appro approached this in a very inefficient way. We wait to do participation until it's very difficult to do, until people are really mad. We do it in this kind of temporary uh, one-off kind of thing why don't we kind of engage in some kind of more um, kind of far-seeing, far-thinking kind of uh, planning process where we think about how we can avoid that kind of situation, how we can kind of beef up the ways in which people might be engaged or encouraged to engage with each other and with government, with other institutions, kind of on, on an ongoing basis with the hope that that will then make all these future crises and big decisions and planning processes easier to do. So I, I think that Great. that's... Great. Thanks, Matt. And Tina... Sorry. Ahead, yeah, I, I'm going to interrupt just because we've got about five more questions uh, and and uh, we've got about five, six more minutes. So um, we can certainly go over the noon time, but I do want to try and bring all of these questions in. Yeah. I think this is a really interesting question from Joseph because you've talked about needing to engage people many different times in many different ways. And his question is, is it important that the participation be meaningful? <laughs> Fascinating question. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think meaningful can mean many different things. Uh, I think one of the, the strongest criteria of meaning is whether people feel that their participation will actually influence what is being done. Uh, and through thin participation opportunities, if they're ranking ideas or they're, they're crowdfunding or they're, crowd, uh, they're engaging in a competition to solve a problem, that has real meaning, as do the thicker forms of participation where people are providing input. I think one of the challenges of participation and recruitment, people don't want to participate if they feel that their voice won't matter, if they feel that their ideas won't be heard, if they, they feel that it's inconsequential. So, meet, yes, meaningfulness matters. Excellent. Thanks very much, Tina. So for Mike, much or most of our approaches in public participation today are aimed at a particular demographic, in brackets, white, educated, middle or plus income. How can we begin to encourage resource allocation to build an equitable, not necessarily equal, dedication of community building? Well, I guess I wouldn't necessarily agree with the first statement there. I mean, I think a lot of us are engaged in lots of work which is trying to to bring in, bring to the table people who have not been uh, engaged in the past. Um, so so a lot of us are really working on that. Um, and a lot of us have been very successful at it. I mean, but the trick is, I think, that it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it, partly what we're faced with is communities where the network, the kind of social and political networks aren't that well connected. And so in order to kind of bring in people who uh, have not been participating in the past or, or, or who are kind of um, feeling like they're, they're kind of or have in, have in fact been marginalized in a variety of ways, you've got to kind of re-knit that, that network. You've got to kind of make connections with people um, who can then 
help you recruit other people from within those those um, within those communities within those networks. And that's as we all know, it's very time consuming. It's trust building kinds of work, and this is one of the great inefficiencies of kind of temporary one-off participation because you can do all that work and get all these different kinds of people to the table, and it might be a terrific, wonderful experience, and they might feel like it was meaningful and that it had an impact. Um, but then it's over, even when you've done all that and it's been a wild success. And so thinking about those networks, um, thinking about this as a long-term question. Um, and, and, and part of that also, again, I think is coming up with participation opportunities that have more different incentives for, for people, partly because they're social. So the people are going to be participating not just because they want to be heard on some policy question, but they're also participating because they get a chance to see their friends or their child care provider. Thank you very much for that. Sorry. <laughs> Where the presenter stops talking. <laughs> That's okay, Matt. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all good. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I just want to jump in on that, and I think but besides the, the recruitment issue, we also need to think about how people interact. With certain forms of participation, privilege certain forms of communication. And so the more that we can provide different ways that people can communicate with each other and interact, the more likely we are to get diverse groups of people involved. You're here. Thanks, Tina. So um, I'm going to, I have about, um, even more questions have come in. So for those of you that have to leave us, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to keep going for probably about another 10 minutes, Matt and Tina, as long as that's okay with you, just to see if we can get the rest of these questions answered. We will be taping everything, so you just have to skip to the back of the webinar if you miss things. But I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and for those of you that do have to leave, just a reminder, we won't be having a webinar in September because we're going to Portland. And, uh, and, and we certainly hope to be able to feed back to you after the Portland experience as well. But we're going to keep going with the questions now. And this one is from Rosa. Does the book provide recommendations for reaching people in rural and remote communities? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we, we don't tackle that topic uh, directly and specifically, but we do provide examples of a lot of participation opportunities that have happened in rural areas. And we also talk a little bit about uh, the design of participation processes in terms of uh, recruitment, participant preparation, um, communication or interaction forms, and other elements that would speak to the rural and remote areas, but we don't address that directly. Thank you. So this question is from MJ. You were speaking about the importance of getting people involved in planning, but often this can be quite difficult. People are very concerned with immediate realities um, rather than future visions. How, how, how best to counter this? Well, I, I, uh, oh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, in the book, in addition to kind of giving the broad overview, we tackle participation in different policy arenas and at different levels. So there's a chapter on participation in education, a chapter on public health, uh, and also an, and personal health care, and then a chapter on, on uh, land use and planning. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to get that out and then if, repeat the question, Amelia, and maybe Matt. No, that's yeah. That, that's well. You're, you're, that's certainly uh, one of the answers. But but also, I think with with planning things. I mean, I think that's the part of the book where we talk most about neighborhood associations and and homeowners groups and those kinds of very local, um, you know, kinds of of, of institutions, uh, which are potentially very valuable. Occasionally, they're very dynamic. Most of them, however, are pretty, pretty, um, you know. I don't know, suboptimized. <laughs> most of them are not doing that well. Most of them are kind of dominated by small bands of, of kind of, you know, brave volunteers who don't necessarily know how or that they should engage, you know, a larger, more diverse set of their neighbors. And so part of what we've kind of focused on there is, is kind of how do you change that dynamic? How do you kind of equip this or renovate this kind of ground floor of democracy, you know, so that people can actually have um, experiences in these kind of neighborhood groups where they feel like they're actually getting a chance to participate and be heard and, and have fun and, and, um, and be part of a community. So I think in terms of the long-term planning kinds of questions, I think thinking about, you know, not only about the associations and how they can be, um, you know, uh, renovated, but also kind of meanwhile these, these hyper-local online networks that Tina mentioned earlier, 
and which have popped up all over the place, all over the world in a very short period of time. They're already, in many cases, much more dynamic than the kind of old-fashioned associations that are in those same locations. They're often completely disconnected from them. Um, but it, that's another kind of uh, avenue um, for thinking about the, the planning question. Thanks very much. So this is a question from Ron. I agree with the goal to include a range of progressive and, and uh, conservative interests, but what if the stated intention for one extreme or the other is to sabotage and stop the process? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think one, one, I mean, I mean, so, okay, so one way of, of answering this is to say that yes, we, Tina and I feel like, you know, uh, participation itself is not necessarily a partisan, or certainly not a partisan, or even necessarily an ideological kind of cause. It it's, has a different kind of logic to it. On the other hand, when people are explicitly trying to stop a process, I think it's perfectly fine that you advocate for the process, advocate for what you're trying to do, and, and try to make that as plain and as, as compelling as you can. Um, and that it's not your partisan, you know, um, bias here. It's simply kind of a, a need to kind of give people a, a meaningful chance to be heard. The other part is is that you know the the kind of conventional forms of participation. One of their huge weaknesses is that they're much easier to hijack than any other form. And so this is part of the uh, the pitch. Obviously, you can be making to 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 public officials or other people you're trying to talk to about good participation is that the ways that they're used to be used to do doing participation are in fact much more likely to be dominated or taken over by one particularly vocal or well-organized group. So using kind of all the even when somebody's okay. trying to kind of disrupt it, it can actually resist, you know, or, or that kind of plan to take over can in fact backfire on the people who are trying to, t to kind of hijack the process. Okay, thanks, for, thanks very much. Um, we did have a question from Stephen regarding the public participation playbook um, and, and that there was a lot of recommended best practices and metrics described in this playbook and he was just wondering your thoughts on, on the playbook itself. Matt? Yeah. Uh, I, the playbook is certainly an advance of where the U.S. federal government has been. I think there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and one of the real challenges with the playbook is that it doesn't quite distinguish between all of these different ways of thinking about participation. That said, it's still a huge leap from where we were thinking about participation, uh, you know, even, even two years ago, at least for the U.S. federal government. Yeah, I think the playbook... Perfect. Thank um, you very much for that is a step forward. It could be a whole lot better if, if, if the playbook simply incorporated a lot of the feedback that, that people in the participation community have, have offered um, or, or text that has been offered. I mean, I think um, there's been a stated willingness on the part of the, of the people in, in, in the federal government to, to actually incorporating that, all that feedback and all that, those, those, those uh, recommendations. So far, they have not done it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tina. I'm, the other things, the other questions are not even questions. They're comments about thank you very much. This has been a great uh, webinar. Um, they really appreciated your uh, your candor, um, providing all of the information, exchanging your great work. So, so they're all thank you, thank you, thank yous uh, coming your way. And I'm just going to add another one, and that is on behalf of IAP2 USA and IAP2 Canada, I want to sincerely thank uh, both of you uh, for taking the time. It's great to see your book out. I know you've been uh, working on it for a while, and so it's great to see that it's out and it's published and that people are purchasing it. Um, and uh, so I'm going to leave the last words to both of you. Um, uh, coming with a thank you from all of us. So Matt, over to you, and then to Tina. Well, I know I thank you, Amelia, uh, and thanks Drew in the background who's done all the polls and everything and set this up, and thanks Tina, my partner in crime. And I also want to thank all of you. And of course, it's it's a sign of what a kind of committed and close knit community that you, you are. That I think for well, most of those those questions, we, we, Amelia, you only gave the first names, but I knew exactly who those people were. <laughs> so I appreciate and I know the work that you do. So, um, so I appreciate that and I thank you for it. Thanks, Matt. Tina. 
Yes, no, just thank you to IAP2 and thank you to everybody for joining in on, uh, on the webinar. We, we really appreciate that you took time out of your busy days to come do this. And Matt and I are completely open to feedback on this book. You know, it's a book about participation, so we hope you participate in helping us to improve it. Uh, so please, we're easily findable. Uh, I think everybody knows Matt, and I think I'm the only teen in the bocce in the world. So please send us your comments and feedback and ideas. We'd appreciate it. Only so Tina thank you, Tina, and thank you, Matt. <laughs> there you go. People are going to Google that now, Tina. You know. know that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> if you find another one, Tina don't tell me. Matt, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Um, our next webinar will be taking place in October, and there will be more information coming soon. Thank you, guys. Take care. Enjoy the rest of the summer. September's around the corner. Bye-bye now. Bye, thank you. Thank you.